You guys made some news today announcing some new guidelines around the use of AI in elections. I'm sure it's all uh, stuff that the, the, the Davos set love to hear. Uh, you banned the use of chat GPT in political campaigns. You introduced cryptographic watermarks for images created by Dali to, to create kind of provenance and transparency around the use of AI generated images. I read it and I thought, you know, this is great. Some of these principles are shared by much larger platforms like Facebook and TikTok and YouTube, and they have struggled to enforce it. How do you make it real? I mean, these are, a lot of these are things that we've been doing for a long time, and we have a really strong safety systems team that um, not only uh, sort of has monitoring, but we're actually able to leverage our own tools in order to scale our enforcement, which gives us, I think, a significant advantage. Um, but uh, so there are this. There are also some really important partnerships, like with the National Association of the Secretaries of State, so we can surface authoritative voting information. So we have quite a few ways that we are able to enforce this. I mean, Sam, are you? Does this put your mind at ease that we don't uh, that that open AI doesn't move the needle in in some 77 upcoming critical democratic elections in 2024? No, we're quite focused on it. Uh, and I think it's good that our mind is not at ease. I think it's good that we have a lot of anxiety and are going to do everything we can to get it as right as we can. Um, I think our role is very different than the role of a distribution platform, but still important. We'll have to work with them, too. Uh, it'll, you know, it's like you generate here and distribute here. Uh, and there needs to be a good conversation between them. But we also have the benefit of having watched what's happened in previous cycles with previous uh, you know, technologies. And I don't think this will be the same as before. I, I think it's always a mistake to try to fight the last war. But we do get to take away some learnings from that. And so I, I wouldn't, you know, I, I think it'd be terrible if I said, oh, yeah, I'm not worried. I feel great. Like, we're going to have to watch this incredibly closely this year. Super tight monitoring, super tight feedback loop. Anna, um, you, were, you were at Facebook before OpenAI. So, so I almost apologize for asking it this, in this way, uh, probably a trigger phrase, but do you worry about another Cambridge Analytical, Analytica moment? I think, as Sam alluded to, there are a lot of learnings that we can leverage. But also OpenAI, from its inception, has been a company that thinks about these issues. Like it was one of the reasons that it was founded. So I think I am a lot less concerned, because these are issues that our teams have been thinking about from the beginning of uh, our building of these tools. Sam, Donald Trump just won the Iowa caucus yesterday. Uh, we are now sort of confronted with the reality of this upcoming election. W what do you think is at stake in the, in the US election for, for tech and for the safe stewardship of AI? Do you feel like that's a, a critical issue that voters should and will have to consider in this election? I think the now confronted is part of the problem. Uh, I actually think most people who come to Davos. Wait, say that again? I didn't quite get that. I think part of the problem is we're saying we're now confronted. You know, yeah. It never occurred to us that what Trump is saying might be resonating with a lot of people. And now all of a sudden, after this performance in Iowa, oh man. Um, it's a very like Davos centric <laughs> yeah. view, you know? Um, I've been here for two days, I guess. <laughs> I just guess in your head. Uh, so I, I would love if we had a lot more reflection and if we started a lot sooner um, about, and we didn't feel now confronted. But uh, I think there's a lot at stake at this election. I think elections are you know, huge deals. I believe that America is going to be fine, no matter what happens in this election. I believe that AI is going to be fine, no matter what happens in this election. And we will have to work very hard to make it so. Um, but this is not. You know, no one wants to sit up here and like hear me rant about politics. So I'm going to stop after this. <laughs> um, but I think there has been a real failure to sort of learn lessons about what what's kind of like working for the citizens of America and what's not. Anna, I want to ask you the same question. Uh, um, you know, taking your political background into account, what do you feel like for Silicon Valley, for AI, is at stake in the U.S. election? I think what has struck me and has been really remarkable is that the conversation around AI has remained very bipartisan. And so, you know, I think that the one concern I have is that somehow... Both parties hate it. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> no, but you know, this is like an area where um, you know, e Republicans tend to, of course, have a, an approach where they are not as in favor of regulation. But on this, I think there's agreement on both parties that they are consider they believe that something is needed on this technology. You know, Senator Schumer has this bipartisan effort that he's running with his Republican counterparts. Again, uh, when we speak to people in D.C. on both sides of the aisle, f for now, it seems like they're on the same page. And do you feel like all the existing campaigns are equally articulate about the, about the issues relating to AI? I don't know that AI has really been a campaign issue to date. So it will be interesting to see how that if, evolves. If we're right about what's going to happen here, this is like bigger than just a technological revolution in some sense. I mean, so, sort of like all technological revolutions or societal revolutions. But this one feels like it can be much more of that than usual. And so it, it is going to become uh, a social issue, a political issue. Mm -hmm. um, it already has in some ways. But I think it is strange to both of us that it's not more of that already. Mm -hmm. But with what we expect to happen this year, not with the election, but just with the, the increase in the capabilities of the products, uh, and as people really catch up with what's going to happen, what is happening, what's already happened, uh, there's like a lot of inertia always in society. Well, th I mean, there are political figures in the US and around the world like Donald Trump, who have successfully tapped into a feeling of you know, dislocation, uh, anger of the working class, the feeling of you know exacerbating inequality or uh, technology leaving people behind. Is there the danger that uh, you, you know, know AI furthers those trends? Yes, for sure. I think that's something to think about. But one of the things that surprised us very pleasantly on the upside, because uh, you know when you start building a technology, you start doing research, you. You kind of say, well, we'll follow where the science leads us. And when you put a product, you'll say, this is going to co-evolve with society, and we'll follow where users lead us. But it's not, you get, you get to steer it, but only somewhat. There's some which is just like, this is what the technology can do. This is how people want to use it. And this is what it's capable of. And this has been much more of a tool than I think we expected. It is not yet, and again, in the future, it'll, it'll get better, but it's not yet like, replacing jobs in the way or to the degree that people thought it was going to. It is this incredible tool for productivity. And you can see people magnifying what they can do um, by a factor of two or five, or in some way that doesn't even talk to it. Makes sense to talk about a number because they just couldn't do the things at all before. And that is, I think, quite exciting. This, this new vision of the future that we didn't really see when we started. We kind of didn't know how it was going to go. And very thankful the technology did go in this direction. But where this is a tool that magnifies what humans do, lets people do their jobs better, lets the AI do parts of jobs. And of course, jobs will change. And of course, some jobs will totally go away. But the human drives are so strong in the sort of way that society works is so strong that I think, and I can't believe I'm saying this because it would have sounded like an ungrammatical sentence to me at some point. But I think AGI will get developed in the reasonably close-ish future. And it'll change the world much less than we all think. It'll change jobs much less than we all think. And again, that sounds, I may be wrong again now, but that wouldn't have even compiled for me as a sentence at some point, given my conception then of how EGI was going to go. As you've watched the technology develop, have you both changed your views on how significant the job dislocation and disruption will be as AGI comes into focus? So this is actually an area that we, you know, we have a policy research team that studies this. And they've seen pretty significant impact in terms of changing the way people do jobs rather than job dislocation. And I think that's actually going to accelerate in that it's going to change more people's jobs. Um, but as Sam said, so far, it hasn't been the significant re a replacement of jobs. You know, you hear a coder say, OK, I'm like two times more productive, three times more productive, whatever, than they used to be. And I like, can never code again without this tool. You mostly hear that from the younger ones. but. Um, it turns out, and I think this will be true for a lot of industries, the world just needs a lot more code than we have people to write right now. And so it's not like we run out of demand. It's that people can just do more. Expectations go up, but ability goes up, too. Demand well, goes up. I want to ask you about another news report today that suggested that OpenAI was relaxing its restrictions around the use of AI in military projects and developing weapons. Can you say more about that? And yeah, what work are you doing with the US Department of Defense and other military agencies? So a lot of these policies were written um, before we even knew what these people would use our tools for. So the, what, th this was not actually just the adjustment of the military use case policies, but across the board to make it more clear 
so that people understand what is possible and what is not possible. But specifically on this um, area, we actually still prohibit the development of weapons, um, the destruction of property, harm to individuals. But for example, we've been doing work with the Department of Defense on um, cybersecurity tools for uh, open source software that secures critical infrastructure. We've been exploring whether it can assist with veteran suicide. And because we previously had a, what essentially was a blanket prohibition on military, many people felt like that would have prohibited any of these use cases, which we think are very much aligned with what we want to see in the world. Has the U.S. government asked you to restrict the level of cooperation with uh, militaries in other countries? Um, they haven't asked us, but we certainly are not, you know, right for now, actually, our discussions are focused on um, U United States national security agencies. And, um, you know, I think we have always believed that democracies <laughs> need to be in the lead on this technology. Uh, Sam, changing topics, uh, give us an update on the GPT store. And are you seeing, maybe probably explain it briefly, and are you seeing the same kind of explosion of creativity we saw in the early days of the mobile app stores? Yeah, the same level of creativity and the same level of crap. But it, <laughs> I mean, that happens in the early days as people like feel out a technology. There's some incredible stuff in there too. Um, Give us an the, example. The GPTs. Should I say what GPTs are first? Yeah, sure. Um, so GPTs are a way to do a very lightweight customization of ChatGPT. And if you want it to behave in a particular way, to use particular data, to be able to call out to an external service, um, you can make this thing, and you can do all sorts of like uh, great stuff with it. Um, and then we just recently launched a store where you can see what other people have built and you can share it. And um, I mean, personally, one that I have loved is All Trails. I have this like every other weekend. I would like to like go for a long hike, and there's always it's like the version of Netflix that other people have, where it's like takes an hour to figure out what to watch. It takes me like two hours to figure out what hike to do. And the All Trails thing to like say I want this, I want that. Yeah, you know, I've already done this one, and like here's a great hike. It's been, I, it sounds silly, but I love that one. Have you added any GPTs of your own? To Have the I store? made any? Yeah. Um, I have not put any in the store. Maybe I will. Great. Um, can you give us an update on the volume or, or the pace at which you're seeing new GPTs? Um, the number I know is that there have been 3 million created before we launched the store. I have been in the middle of this trip around the world that has been quite hectic, and I have not been doing my normal daily metrics tracking. So I don't know how it's gone since launch. But I'll tell you, by the slowness of ChatGPT, it's probably doing really well. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you about OpenAI's copyright issues. Uh, how important are publisher relations to OpenAI's business, considering, for example, the lawsuit last month filed against OpenAI by the New York Times? They are important, but not for the reason people think. Um, there is this belief held by some people that, man, you need all of my training data, and my training data is so valuable. And actually, uh, that is generally not the case. We do not want to train on the New York Times data, for example. Um, and all, more generally, we're getting to a world where it's been like data, data, data. You just need more, you need more, you need more. You're going to run out of that at some point anyway. So a lot of our research has been how can we learn more from smaller amounts of very high quality data. And I think the world is going to figure that out. What we want to do with publishers, if they want, is when one of our users says, what happened to Davos today, be able to say, Here's an article from Bloomberg. Here's an article from the New York Times. And here, you know, here's like a little snippet. Or probably not a snippet. There's probably some cooler thing that we can do with the technology. And you know, some people want to partner with us. Some people don't. We've been striking a lot of great partnerships. And we have a lot more coming. Um, and then you know, some people don't want, want to. Uh, we'd rather they just say, we don't want to do that, rather than sue us. But like, we'll, well defend ourselves. <laughs> That's fine, too. I just heard you say you don't want to train on the New York Times. Does that mean? Given the, the legal exposure, you would have done things differently as you trained your model. Here is a tricky thing about that. Um, people, the web is a big thing. And there are people who like copy from the New York Times and put an article without attribution up on some website. And you don't know that's a New York Times article. If the New York Times wants to give us a database of all their articles, or someone else does, and say, hey, don't put anything out that's like a match for this, we can probably do a pretty good job. And um, solve, we don't want to regurgitate someone else's content. Um, but the problem is not as easy as it sounds in a vacuum. I think we can get that number down and down and down and have it be quite low. And that seems like a super reasonable thing to evaluate us on. You know, if you have copyrighted content, whether or not it got put into someone else's thing without our knowledge, and you're willing to show us what it is and say, don't, don't put this stuff as a direct response, we should be able to do that. Um, again, it won't like 1,000. You know, mon monkeys, thousand typewriters, whatever it is. Once in a while, the model will just generate something very close. But on the whole, we should be able to do a great job with this. Um, 
so there's like, there's all the negatives of this. People are like, ah, oh, you know, don't, don't do this. But the positives are, I think there's going to be great new ways to consume and monetize news and other published content. And for every one New York Times situation we have, we have many more super productive things about people that are excited to build the future and not do their theatrics. And, and, what, <laughs> and what about Dolly? I mean, there have been artists who have been upset with Dolly 2, Dolly 3. What, what has that taught you, and how will you do things differently? We engage with the artist community a lot. And uh, you know, we, we try to like, do the request. So one is, don't, don't generate in my style, um, even if you're not training on my data. Super reasonable. So we you know, implement things like that. Um, you know, let me opt out of training, even if my images are all over the internet and you don't know what they are. What I'm, and so there's a lot of other things too. What I'm really excited to do, and the technology isn't here yet, but get to a point where rather than the artist say, I don't want this thing for these reasons, be able to deliver something where an artist can make a great version of Dolly in their style, sell access to that if they want, don't if they don't want, just use it for themselves, uh, or get some sort of economic benefit or otherwise when someone does use their stuff. Um, and, and it's not just training on the images. It really is like, you know, it really is about style. Uh, and and that's, that's the thing that, at least in the artist conversations I've had, that people are super interested in. So for now, it's like, all right, let's know what people don't want. Make sure that we respect that. Um, of course, you can't make everybody happy, but try to like, make the community feel like we're being a good partner. Um, but what, what, I, what I think will be better and more exciting is when we can do things that artists are like, that's awesome. Anna, you are OpenAI's ambassador to Washington, to other capitals around the world. I'm curious what you've taken from your experience at Facebook, what you've taken from the tense relations between a lot of tech companies and governments and regulators over the past few decades, and how you're putting that to use now in OpenAI. Open AI. I mean, so I think one thing that I really learned working in government, and of course I worked in the White House during the 2016 Russia election interference, and people think that that was the first time we'd ever heard of it. But it was something that we had actually been working on for years and thinking, you know, we know that this happens. What do we do about it? And one thing I never did during that period is go out and talk to the companies because it's not actually a typical thing you do in government and was much more rare back then, especially with, you know, these emerging tools. And I thought about that a lot as I entered the tech space that I regretted that and that I wanted governments to be able to really understand the technology and how the decisions are made by these companies. And also just honestly, when I first joined OpenAI, no one, of course, had heard of OpenAI in government for the most part. And I thought, every time I used it, I thought, oh my god, if I'd had this for the eight years I was in the administration, I could have gotten 10 times more done. So for me, it was really, how do I get my colleagues to use it? Um, especially with OpenAI's mission to make sure these tools benefit everyone, I don't think that'll ever happen unless governments are incorporating it to serve citizens more efficiently and faster. And so this is actually one of the things I've been most excited about is to just really get governments to use it for everyone's benefit. I mean, I'm hearing like a lot of sincerity in that pitch. Are regulators receptive to it? It feels like a lot are coming to the conversation probably with a good deal of skepticism because of past interactions with Silicon Valley? I think I mostly don't even really get to talk about it because for the most part people are interested in governance and regulation and I think that they know um, theoretically that there's a lot of benefit. The government, many governments are not quite ready to incorporate. I mean, there are exceptions, obviously people who are really at the forefront. So it's not, you know, I think often I just don't even really get to that conversation. So I want to ask you both about the dramatic turn of events in uh, November. Sam, one day the window on these questions will close. Um, that is not Do you think they will? I, I, uh, <laughs> I think at some point they probably will. But okay. it hasn't happened yet, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, I guess my question is, is you know, have you addressed the, govern the governance issues, the very unique uh, corporate structure at OpenAI with the nonprofit board and the yeah. cap profit arm that led to your ouster. We're going to focus first on putting a great full board in place. Um, I expect us to make a lot of progress on that in the coming months. Uh, and then after that, the new board uh, will take a look at the governance structure. But I think we debated both. What does orders. that mean? Is it, should OpenAI be a f traditional Silicon Valley for profit company? We will never be a traditional company, but the structure. I think we should take a look at the structure. Maybe the answer we have now is right, but I think we should be willing to consider other things. But I think this is not the time for it, and the focus on the board first. And then we'll go look at it from all angles. 
I mean, presumably you have investors, including Microsoft, including uh, your venture capital supporters, uh, your employees, who uh, over the long term are seeking a return on their investment. Um, I think one of the things that's difficult to express about OpenAI is the degree to which our team and the people around us, investors, Microsoft, whatever, are committed to this mission. Um, in the middle of that crazy few days, uh, at one point, I think like 97, something like that, 98% of the company signed uh, a letter saying, you know, we're all going to resign and go do something else. And that would have torched everyone's equity. And for a lot of our employees, like this is all or the great majority of their wealth. And people being willing to go do that, I think is quite unusual. Our investors, who also were about to like watch their stakes go to zero, were just like, how can we support you and whatever is best for, for the mission, Microsoft too. Um, I feel very, very fortunate about that. Uh, of course, also would like to make all of our shareholders a bunch of money, but it was very clear to me what people's priorities were, and uh, that meant a lot. I, w I, I sort of smiled because you came to the Bloomberg Tech Conference in last June, and uh, Emily Chang asked, uh, it was something along, along the lines of, why should we trust you? And you very candidly says, you shouldn't. And you said, the board should be able to fire me if, if they want. And of course, then they did, and you <laughs> quite uh, adeptly orchestrated your return. Actually, let me tell you something. Um, I, the board did that. I was like. I think this is wild, super confused, super caught off guard, but this is the structure. And I immediately just went to go thinking about what I was going to do next. It was not until some board members called me the next morning that I even thought about really coming back. Um, when they asked, I'd be like, you know, you want to come back? Uh, you want to talk about that? But like, the board did have all of the power there. Now, you know what? I'm not going to say that next thing. <laughs> but I, 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 I think you should con continue. I think I, no. <laughs> I would, I would also just say that I think that there's a lot of narratives out there. It's like, oh, well, this was orchestrated by all these other forces. It's not accurate. I mean, it was the employees of OpenAI that wanted this and that thought that it was the right thing for Sam to be back. The, you know, like, yeah, the thing I'll say is uh, I think it's important that I have an entity that like, can fire this. But that entity has got to have some accountability, too. And that is a clear issue with what happened. Right. Anna, you wrote a remarkable letter to employees during the saga. And one of the many reasons I was excited to, to have you on stage today was ju to just ask you, what were those five days like for you? And why did you step up and write that? Uh... Anna can clearly answer this if she wants to. But like, is really what you want to spend our time on, like the soap opera, rather than like what AGI is going to do? I mean, I'm wrapping like, it up. But, the... but um, she, I mean, go I, ahead. I, I think but... people are interested. Okay, All right. Well, we can leave it here. If you want no, no, yeah, let's, let's answer that so question and then we'll, we'll, we can move on. I would just say uh, for color that it happened the day before the entire company was supposed to take a week off. So we were all on Friday uh, preparing to, you know, have a restful week after an insane year. So then, you know, many of us slept on the floor of the office for a week. <laughs> right. There's a question here that I think is a, a really good one. We are at Davos. Climate change is on the agenda. Um, the question is, does, does, could, well, I'm going to give it a different spin. Considering the compute costs and the, the, the need for chips, does the development of AI and the path to AGI threaten to take us in the opposite direction on the climate? Um, we do need way more energy in the world than I think we thought we needed before. My, my whole model of the world is that the two important currencies of the future are compute slash intelligence and energy. Um, you know, the ideas that we want and the ability to make stuff happen and uh, the ability to like run the compute. And I think we still don't appreciate the energy needs of this technology. Um, the good news, to the degree there's good news, is there's no way to get there without a breakthrough. We need fusion or we need like radically cheaper solar plus storage or something at massive scale, like a scale that no one is really planning for. Um, so we, it's totally fair to say that AI is going to need a lot of energy. But it will force us, I think, to invest more in the technologies that can deliver this, none of which are the ones that are burning the carbon. Like That'll be those all those right. unbelievable number of fuel trucks. And the by the way, you back all the uh, jets there. one or more nuclear uh, Yeah, I, I personally think that is either the most likely or the second most likely 
approach to You feel to like the world. the world is more receptive to that technology? Now, certainly, historically, not in the US. Um, I think the world is still, unfortunately, pretty negative on fission. Super positive on fusion. It's a much easier story. Um, but I wish the world would embrace fission much more. I, look, I, I may be too optimistic about this, but I think, I, th I think we have paths now to massive, a massive energy transition away from burning carbon. It'll take a while. Those cars are going to keep driving. There's all, you know, there's all of the transport stuff. It'll be a while till there's like a fusion reactor in every cargo ship. Um, but if, if we can drop the cost of energy as dramatically as I hope we can, then the math on carbon capture just so changes. Uh, I still expect, unfortunately, the world is on a path where we're going to have to do something dramatic with climate, with like geoengineering as a, as a, as a band-aid, as a stopgap. But I think we do now see a path to the long-term solution. So I, I want to just go back to my question. In terms of moving in the opposite direction, it sounds like the answer is potentially yes on the demand side unless we take drastic action on the supply but side. There, there is no, I, I see no way to supply this, with, to, to manage the supply side without a really big breakthrough. Right. Which is, this is does this frighten you guys? Because, um, you know, the world hasn't been that versatile when it comes to supply, but AI, as you know, you have pointed out, it's not going to take its time until we start generating enough power. It motivates us to go invest more in fusion and invest more in new storage and, and not only the technology, but what it's going to take to deliver this at the scale that AI needs and that the whole globe needs. So I think it would be not helpful for us to just sit there and be nervous. Um, we're just like, hey, we see what's coming with very high conviction it's coming. How can we use our abilities, uh, our capital, our whatever else to do this? And in the process of that, hopefully deliver a solution for the rest of the world, not just AI training workloads or inference workloads. And it felt like in 2023, we had the beginning of a almost hypothetical conversation about regulating AI. What, what should we expect in 2024? And you know, does it, do, do, do governments act? Does it, does it become real? And what, is, what does AI safety look like? So I think we, it is becoming real. You know, the EU is uh, on the cusp of actually finalizing this regulation, which is going to be quite extensive. And the Biden administration uh, wrote the longest executive order, I think, in the history of executive orders uh, covering this technology. And it's being implemented in 2024 because they gave agencies, you know, uh, a bunch of homework for how to implement this and govern this technology. And, and it's happening. So I think it is really moving forward. Um, but what exactly safety looks like of what it even is, I think this is still a conversation we haven't bottomed out on. You know, we've founded this frontier model forum in part. Yeah, so maybe that, explain what that yeah. is. So this is, um, for now, this is um, Microsoft, OpenAI, Anthropic, and um, Google. But it will, I think, expand to other frontier labs. But really, right now, all of us are working on safety. We all red team our models. Um, we all do a lot of this work, but we really don't have even a common vocabulary. Um, or a standardized approach. And to the extent that people think like, well, this is just industry, but uh, this is in part in response to many governments <laughs> that have asked us for this very thing. So like, what is it across industry that you think are viable best practices? Is there a risk that regulation starts to discourage entrepreneurial activity in, in AI? I mean, I think y y people are terrified of this. Um, this is why I think Germany and France and Italy in, in, interjected into the EU um, AI Act discussion because they are really concerned about their own domestic industries being sort of undercut before they even had a chance to develop. Were you satisfied with your old boss's executive order? And was, the, <laughs> was there anything in there that uh, you had lobbied against? No. And in fact, it, you know, I think it's it was really good in that it wasn't just these other restrictions. It's like and then also please go and think about how your agency will actually leverage this to do your work better. So I was really encouraged that they actually did have a balanced approach. Um, Sam, first time at Davos? First time. OK. Is um, uh, you mentioned that uh, you'd prefer to spend more of our time here on stage talking about AGI. <laughs> what is the message you're bringing to political leaders and other business leaders here, if you could distill it? Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I think 2023 was a year where the world woke up to the possibility of 
these systems becoming increasingly capable and increasingly general. But GPT-4, I think, is best understood as a preview. And it was more over the bar than we expected of utility for more people in more ways. But you know, it's easy to point out the limitations. And again, we're thrilled that people love it and use it as much as they do. But this is, progress here is not linear. And this is the thing that I think is really tricky. Humans have horrible intuition for exponentials, at least speaking for myself, but it seems like a common part of the human condition. Um, what does it mean if GPT-5 is as much better than GPT-4 as 4 was to 3 and 6 is to 5? And what does it mean if we're just on this trajectory now? Um, what, uh, you know, on the question of regulation, I think it's great that different countries are going to try different things. Some countries will probably ban AI. Some countries will probably say no guardrails at all. Both of those, I think, will turn out to be suboptimal, and we'll, we'll get to see different things work. But as these systems become more powerful, um, as, they, as they become more deeply integrated into the economy, as they become something we all use to do our work, and then as things beyond that happen, as they become capable of discovering new scientific knowledge for humanity, even as they become capable of doing AI research at some point, um, the world is going to change more slowly and then more quickly than, than we might imagine, but the world is going to change. Um, this is you know, a thing I, I always say to people is no one knows what happens next, and I really believe that, and I think keeping the humility about that is really important. You can see a few steps in front of you, but not too many. Um, but when cognition, the, when the cost of cognition falls by a factor of a thousand or a million, when the capability of it becomes, uh, it augments us in ways we can't even imagine. You know, uh, like one example I, I try to give to people is, what if everybody in the world had a really competent company of 10,000 great virtual employees, experts in every area, they never fought with each other, they didn't need to rest. They got really smart. They got smarter at this rapid pace. What would we be able to create for each other? What would that do to the world that we experience? And the answer is none of us know, of course. And none of us have any strong intuitions for that. I can imagine it sort of, but it's not like a clear picture. Um, and this is going to happen. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't get to steer it. It doesn't mean we don't get to work really hard to make it safe and to do it in a responsible way. But we are going to go to the future. And I think the best way to get there in a way that works is the level of engagement we now have. Part of the reason, a big part of the reason we believe in iterative deployment of our technology is that people need time to gradually get used to it, to understand it. We need time to make mistakes while the stakes are low. Governments need time to make some policy mistakes. And also technology and society have to co-evolve in a case like this. Uh, so technology is going to change with each iteration, but so is the way society works. And that's got to be this interactive, iterative process. Um, and we need to embrace it, but have caution without fear. And how long do we have for this iterative process to play? I, I think it's surprisingly continuous. I don't, like, if I try to think about discontinuities, I can sort of see one when AI can do really good AI research. Um, and I can see a few others too, but that's like an evocative example. Um, but on the whole, I don't think it's about like crossing this one line. I think it's about this continuous exponential curve we climb together. And so how long do we have? Like no time at all and infinite. I saw GPT-5 trending on X earlier this week, and I clicked, and I, you know, couldn't. I, it sounded, uh, you know, probably misinformed. But what what can you tell us about GPT-5, and is it an exponential, uh, you know, I improvement over what we've seen? Look, I don't know what we're going to call our next model. Um, I don't know when. Are you going to get creative with the uh, the naming process? Uh, I don't want to be like shipping iPhone 27. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's not my style quite. Uh, but I, I think the next model we release, uh, I expect it to be very impressive to do new things that were not possible with GPT-4, to do a lot of things better. And I expect us to like take our time and make sure we can launch something that we feel good about and responsible about. Within OpenAI, some employees consider themselves to be quote, building God. <laughs> is that? I haven't is heard that. that. OK. Is um, I mean, I've heard like people say that facetiously. But uh, I think almost all 
employees would say they're building a tool, more so than they thought they were going to be, which they're thrilled about. You know, this confusion in the industry of, are we building a creature, or are we building a tool? Um, I think we're much more building a tool, and that's much better. Uh, to transition like, to something, yeah, oh, go, go ahead, no, no. No, 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 you finish your thought. Oh, I was just gonna say, like the, the we think of ourselves as tool builders. Um, AI is much more of a tool than a product and much, much more of a tool than this like entity. And uh, one of the most wonderful things about last year was seeing just how much people around the world could do with that tool. I mean, they astonished us. And I think we'll just see more and more. And human creativity uh, and ability to like do more with better tools is remarkable. And, and before we have to start wrapping up, you know, there was a report that you were working with Johnny Ive on an AI-powered device, either within OpenAI, perhaps as a separate company. You know, I bring it up because CES was earlier this month, and AI-powered devices were the, the talk of, of the conference. You know, can you give us an update on that? And are we does AI bring us to the beginning of the end of the smartphone era? Smartphones are fantastic. I don't think smartphones are going anywhere. Uh, I think what they do, they do really, really well, and they're very general. If there is a new thing to make, uh, I don't think it replaces a smartphone in the way that I don't think smartphones replace computers. But if there's a new thing to make that helps us do more, better, you know, in a, in a new way, given that we have this unbelievable change, like, I don't think we quite, I don't spend enough time, I think, like, marveling at the fact that we can now talk to computers and they understand us and do stuff for us. Like, it is a new affordance, a new way to use a computer. And if we can do something great there, uh, a new kind of computer, we should do that. And if it turns out that the smartphone's really good and this is all software, then fine. But I bet there is something great to be done. And um, the partnership with Johnny, is that an open AI effort? Is that another company? I have not heard anything official about a partnership with Johnny. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, Anna, I'm going to give you the last word. As you and Sam meet with business and world leaders here at Davos, what's the message you want to leave them with? Um, I think that there is an, a trend where people feel more fear than excitement about this technology. And I understand that we have to work very hard to make sure that the best version of this technology is realized. But I do think that many people are engaging with this via the leaders here, and that they really have a responsibility to make sure that um, they are sending a balanced message so that um, people can really actually engage with it and realize the benefit of this technology. Can I have 20 seconds? Absolutely. One, one of the things that I think OpenAI has not always done right, and the field hasn't either, is find a way to build these tools in a way uh, and also talk about them that don't, don't get that kind of response. I think ChatGPT, one of the best things it did is it shifted the conversation to the positive, not because we said, trust us, it'll be great, but because people used it. And are like, oh, I get this. I use this in a very natural way. The smartphone was cool because I didn't even have to use a keyboard and phone. I could use it more naturally. Talking is even more natural. Um, speaking of Johnny, Johnny is a genius. And one of the things that I think he has done again and again about computers is figuring out a way to make them very human compatible. And I think that's super important with this technology, making this feel like a, you know, not this mystical thing from sci-fi, not this scary thing from sci-fi, but this, this new way to use a computer that you love and that really feels like, I still remember the first iMac I got and what that felt like to me relative to any It was heavy. Computer. It was heavy, but the fact that it had that handle, even though as like a kid it was very heavy to carry, um, it did mean that I was like, I had a different relationship with it because of that handle and because of the way it looked. I was like, oh, I can move this thing around. I could unplug it and throw it out the window if it tried to like wake up and take over. That's nice. Um, and I think the way we design our technology and our products really does matter.